Thank you. Um, let's behave like you haven't seen me on stage before. And uh, Dzień dobry. This is the only Polish word I'm phrase I know, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I know that this is the graveyard class. So there was this party and everyone had fun. So I wasn't even expected as many of this crowd. So thank you for showing up. And let's go to the other slides. Our subject today is breaking the fourth wall. And um, why are we talking about this? Let's discuss. Uh, I am a mid-core game designer at Boombit. And also, I have a background in academy. And I was a research assistant at Istanbul Bilgi University for uh, a couple of years. And also, I have a book chapter on the subject. So this is a highly theoretical lecture. And I hope you are prepared for this. If you are hangover or something, I understand. And I cannot see you right now. So if you are sleeping or something, it is okay, I'm not checking. <laughs> so let's continue. Also, I have been uh, giving lectures on storytelling and narrative design at Istanbul Big University. So as a mobile game designer, why I am talking about breaking the fourth wall in video games? The thing is, uh, Boombit came to me with this uh, proposition that I would give a lecture on Digital Dragons. And I was like, OK, of course. And I went with this list of subjects. And they were very um, encouraging to me about the subject that I had from my previous work. So um, breaking the fourth wall was something I had a vast research on. So they were very encouraging. And I want to thank them from the stage that they would let me to talk about on the subject. So, yeah, we see Geralt, so Poland, CD Project Red and stuff, you know. <laughs> As I said, this is a very theoretical subject, and in the academy, we do everything with a system. So, um, I'm not going to just talk about those right now, but with the slides, uh, you are going to see one by one what Break and the fourth wall was in other media before video games. We are going to talk about a bit of the history of it and uh, how the term applies to uh, video games. And then I will uh, tell you about the terminology that I created for breaking the fourth wall in video games. And if we have time, I hope so, because this tends to take a, a bit long, sorry about that. We will talk about player experience and implementation of the device. So um, this is a quote from Diderot, and um, this is from 18th century. But uh, normally, breaking the fourth wall was not uh, started until 20th century. The thing is, um, I will read the quote first. When you write or act, think no more of the audience than if it had never existed. Right now, I'm thinking of you as not existing, and I'm doing this speech in front of the mirror. And imagine a huge wall across the front of the stage separating you from the audience and behave exactly as if the curtain had never risen. So here, the uh, amplification is that they are referring to the realism. So do as realistic as possible whatever you are doing on stage so that the audience is looking for a slice of life. They are seeing something real. But this belongs to uh, 19th century realism. And it wasn't that way before theater. So there was breaking the fourth wall, but it wasn't named before. So there was this choruses, aside, or soliloquy. These were devices that the actors and actresses would directly transmit messages to the audience. But after a while, they decided that this is not realistic. And as game designers, 
uh, lately we have been doing this a lot, so that we are saying, oh, no tutorial, we have to just implement it somehow in the game design because it is, it is not realistic, it is not diegetic. So this was a school of thought. Realism is a school of thought. You don't have to go for that. So this is what they were thinking at 19th century. And this is a depiction of the fourth wall. Also, there is another name for uh, fourth wall, and the wall is metaphorical, right? So, suspension of disbelief is um, about stopping judging what is happening on the stage. So, you just stop judging and think like the fiction that is happening on the stage is real, and you immerse yourself, you engage, you just watch everything that is happening and suspend to judge, question anything that is happening on the stage. And this is a uh, definition from Coleridge, from this dictionary, and again, uh, this, this has changed in time, but we can say it is all about stopping judging and believing in the fiction. So, yeah. Uh, we have this character, as you all know, that is all about breaking the fourth wall, and <laughs> it is when came the postmodernism. Uh, the theater guys think of the same thing, so they would go for uh, before the comedic effect. So it would be from Chaplin and Keaton. Uh, they just wanted to somehow engage with the audience, and they would do this by looking at uh, the screen camera. They were, they were doing that by looking and gesturing to the camera. And afterwards came Brecht. So I should be going very fast. Sorry, it is a very long slide. Um, Brecht came and used it for serious things about the social, cultural, political implications of the things that are happening on stage. He didn't want the audience to be just passive onlookers. He wanted the audience to engage in the thought process. He wanted the audience to just think about the life that they are living right now and question the reality of here and the reality of their own lives. So it was very important for Brett to bring out this side of it and also they were already complaining about not being able to use the classical devices before. So with him, we have started with the postmodernism and it was the 20th century. And we get this in the literature also. So we have metafiction, an uh, artifact that is aware that it is an artifact. It is artificial. So this also is a name for literature, but for game design, we don't have any name. And uh, we will talk about it, why breaking the fourth wall directly does not work for game design. <clears throat> so, breaking the fourth wall is about any practice, anything that is happening on the screen, on stage, that is going to break the illusion that we are watching something that is real and that belongs to that fictional world. So, yeah, it is directly breaking the suspension of disbelief and I think some of you should be uh, very familiar with the scene with Asgore. Anyone has played Undertale? Wow! And finally, we have, this will be more familiar, I think. Um, we have some usage of breaking the fourth wall, or as I'm going to talk about it, as magic circle manipulation, for transmitting some messages to the players. So, for example, in Sonic, we have time management, right? So, you get points, you get score, at the end screen, according to your time also. So, if you wait for three minutes in the idle state, if you leave him like that, he looks at the screen, gets very angry with you, 
and just jumps off the screen and says, I'm out of here. So this is a direct message to the player. And of course, you can do this without breaking the fourth wall or magic circle manipulation. But this is a fine example. You don't have to just go for the realism or anything. And <laughs> let's continue so that. OK. Before, there was this study by Conway where he said that magic circle, uh, by the way, are you aware of the term magic circle? Can uh, you hold your head, uh, hand up if you, anyone just, OK. So uh, with the expansions, you see that um, this space of mind, the playful space of mind, where the rules are different, where the place is different, just expands to the real world and just takes in the real world as an artifact for the gameplay. With the contraction, as we see the Sonic example just a second ago, just it just um, leaves the player out and decides that it doesn't need the player anymore. It is like a power play. But we will talk about this a lot. And also we have this traditional fourth wall breaks and it would be directly talking to the audience or the player and um, understanding that it is a product and also referring to an artifact outside in the real world. But Conway said that we should not be using the terminology that was created for other media. So um, as a result of that, as a researcher, I decided that I would go for it and create something myself. In order to do that, um, we should uh, read these quotes so that uh, we understand what we are exactly talking about. When we enter a fictional world, we do not merely suspend a critical faculty. We just don't stop judging, we also exercise a creative faculty. We push ourselves to believe in the thing that we are looking at. So if the character just breaks the fourth wall and looks at us directly, we don't say like, um, okay, I don't believe in him anymore. What is he doing? Oh my God, this fiction is that, no. It doesn't work that way. So we actively believe in the creation and we think like, oh, okay, this character has this quirk and this character can communicate with me. So it is different. So because of our desire to experience immersion, we focus our attention on the enveloping world and we use our intelligence to reinforce rather than to question the reality of the experience. So. I'm not going to question the term breaking the fourth wall for other media because it is not placed to do so. But again, this is important because this immersion makes us believe in anything. So when we think of suspension of disbelief, eh, it is not that uh, appropriate in those uh, certain moments. So when we enter this circuit, we are not separated from this screen, right? In our hands, we have some kind of device, even VR glasses, we can be totally immersed in the world. So this fourth wall, this screen, this metaphorical separation between the player and the game world does not directly exist. In this world, uh, the player enters the magic circle by plugging himself in a into a cybernetic circuit. And also, in the gameplay, the bodies of the body of player and the gameplay become hybridized. So they incorporate hardware, body, and the game world. And this circuit kind of requires the player to become like a cyborg. So we cannot separate them and we cannot say that, okay, if I communicate with the player character, the fourth wall breaks or anything. So what is magic circle? Magic circle is a term that was used first by Huizinga. And it is a space, it is a playground 
I used in a different I used it in a different manner. So um, since we have a different crowd here, I will directly use the terms that I'm using for this one. It is a temporary world with permeable boundaries within the ordinary world. It is a headspace that we create for ourselves to be in that gameplay. It is a world dedicated to a performance, to the performance of an act apart dependent on rules. And also, the player finds himself, herself, in the psychological bubble that is in a very playful state of mind. I am going very fast with these parts because the fun part comes later. So, um, the term that I uh, would definitely go for, for breaking the fourth wall in video games, would be magic circle manipulation. So, you are playing with that space. You are not perforating it. You, you are perforating it, but we will talk about it. It is like um, you change the rules on the go. You change how the characters are dealing with certain situations. So, there is the subcategories. I will go one by one with all of them, and we will see how it will prevail. So, yeah. Metal Gear Solid. Um, you know it, right? Yeah. Thank you, God. Okay, so <laughs> from this one, this is a great example for the magic circle manipulation because it is like, let's go for the definition first. The circle, the magic circle commences to behave different, unconventionally, and it shatters the player expectations. And the playground that was a very rule-bound place changes, and right now it is a twisted place for the gameplay happen. And the player is continuously allowed and denied control. And also, the game is immersive, and the player continues believing it. Suspension of disbelief is still ongoing, and there are new dynamics. And with those new dynamics, the player has to just go with it. Useless woman. Up to zero. I hope that's not your only trick. You, there's telepathy in the world. No, there's no need for words. <laughs> I am going directly to the moment because I was planning to have this go a little bit longer. But it's useless, I told you. I can read your every thought. Now, let me read your mind. No, perhaps I should say your past. You are a very methodical man, the type that always kicks his tires before he leaves. You are a highly skilled warrior. And in this moment, we see that um, he is starting to read the uh, memory cards. You are a coward. Still don't believe me. Now I'll read more deeply into your soul. Ah, I can see into your mind. So, you like Sui Coven. So, you like Azure Dreams. You like Castlevania, don't you? You enjoy role-playing. I see that you enjoy Konami games. And hmm. you have not you said have not all, said all I can read you. And in the end, there's this... Put your controller on the floor. Put it down as fast as you can. That's good. Now I will move your controller by the power of my will alone. 
And at this moment, we have the controller moving sideways on the floor. So as the player, you feel like, oh, so this is going to be hard because there are things that, this is an old game. So you were like, you weren't aware of those things that the designers can go for. And this created that great feeling in the player like, Okay, I'm going to see something very different now. So this is an example for the deformation, and we will see some subcategories with this one. Doki Doki Literature Club. Have you played it? Yeah, there are some examples that I'm seeing. Perfect. I'm not going to spoil it, but I will just say, just Monica. So it is just about Monica. There is this play with uh, the non-diagetic elements of the game. Um, the diagetic means whatever is belonging inside the game world, whatever that is belonging to the fiction. And non-diagetic means the UI, the menu, the main menu, those are the non-diagetic gameplay elements. So when we go for non-diagetic play, I will not spoil this one, just go play, we see this. So, Deadpool is already a character that is very meta, but taking out the UI uh, bars and level bars out and pushing them, you know, hitting your opponent with it is a very innovative approach, don't you think? I really love when I see something like this. Let's continue. So this is another one. I will just show you one example of it, and you will see the reaction of the player. Strange light fills the room. Twilight is shining through the barrier. He's reading whatever he is saying. It was nice to meet you. Goodbye. What? Oh. Oh. No, 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 no. This is not an option. So there's this pacifist way of play Undertale, for Undertale, and it is the only way to do so, the mercy button. So he just took whatever you have in your hand in order to play the game pacifist. So in that moment, there's this shock, there's this unbelieving um, sound from the player that you can hear. So yeah, surprising the player is another element for this. And uh, we have medium play. Medium play would be when uh, the gameplay includes the things that are specific for the hardware or the software. It would be about the reset buttons, just like in the computer, um, reset the computer now example that we have here. When you see this, you just go and try to find a computer in the gameplay, but it is referring to Sega Genesis's reset button. So you have to reset the game in order to continue. This is a very weird way of implementing this, but again, it is fun. It is a weird challenge for the player. Of course, it is old school. We cannot do something like this. But again, it is innovative in its time. And this is from Pony Island. Have you played Pony Island? Yeah, I have seen one, two, three, and I will not spoil it. But you can also go for some distractions from the software of the medium that the player is playing the game. It might be a computer, it might be, I don't know, a console. When you send messages through the computer, the player gets distracted, and I definitely recommend you to play this one in order to see this example, because it is a spoiler. I don't want to spoil this. 
Oh, what's happening? Okay. By the way, I have to check my time, but there is this timer that is not working. Sorry. Okay. Perfect. So this was an example from very old times. This is about real world play. So the paratexts that are coming with the game uh, are used somehow in order to uh, progress in the gameplay. This letter came with the box of the game and you had to dip it in water in order to find out the code to continue in the game. Of course, this was a way for the designers to go for uh, having the game not being copied, right? So that the player had to just, because the internet was not, uh, it is 90s. So the player had to go buy it or had to ask to his friends in order to find the code. So this was a way to implement it. But again, uh, it was a challenge for the players. This is another example of the use of real world play. And um, the frequency that is necessary to contact Merrill uh, in Metal Gear Solid was on the CD case. And this, this is an element from the real world. It doesn't have, normally, if we were to talk to some realist, it doesn't have anything to do with the game world, but it belongs to the game world. And Max Payne, any uh, players? Cool, perfect. Uh, is there a remake that's coming? Did you hear anything? I, I think so, right? There's this remake that is going to happen. So it was a gorgeous game in its time. And <laughs> there is this um, you know, comic look in some cut screens, and you see like his state of mind, and he says, I was in a computer game. Funny as hell, it was the most horrible thing I could, uh, I could think of. So this is another example where the person is talking about the awareness, the character is talking about the awareness that he has about the artificiality, artifice, of the work that he's in. So when we go for the magic circle perforation, we are looking for more, um, let's say, classical kind of fourth wall breaks. But again, with the player's state in the circuit, we cannot directly call them breaking the fourth wall. So when the game addresses the player directly, when the game openly talks about its artifice, or when it displays awareness of anything or anyone that belongs to the real world, we say uh, it is magic circle perforation. And this is an example to direct ad address that we have. Don't you think you've seen enough? Yeah. There's this communication to the player what are you watching? I know you're a peeping Tom and you are playing this game because I'm a lady in some kind of very tight clothing. So yeah, you have seen enough, just go. And I will skip this, this example because again, this is spoiler. What you heard from me is the truth. <laughs> Sorry. And I haven't put anything about Stanley Parable, just the name, go play the game. Because it has, a, if you haven't already, um, there is this commentary on the relationship of the designer and the player. And I would love you to see it and just, you have to experience it yourself. I, I am not going to spoil it for you. But I can go for Monkey Island, so <laughs> it's an old game. This is self-awareness when the game is talking about its artificiality. And this, let's go back. This scene is 
Really funny. You are lost. One, nine, zero, zero, seven, four, zero, J, E, D, I. Remember, kids, if you're under 18, ask your parents before calling. That is the talking. Lucasfilm Games Hint Line, Chester speaking. And I'm lost in the Dinky Island jungle in Monkey 2. Ah, uh, look, there are only two ways out of the room you're in. Figure it out, knucklehead. And I'm lost in the Dinky Island jungle in Monkey 2. I told you, just walk off the edge of the screen. How hard could that be? When is Swallow gonna ship? It's been out for some time now. Where have you been playing some fresh? <laughs> so, I won't play all of it, but as you see, this is a fun example from a comedy game, and I, I love Monkey Island, I have finished all of them. And it is so self-aware all the time, but it makes it that unique for us, because it has this way of communicating with us as the player. It doesn't just say like, you don't exist. I am the character, you don't exist there. So, again, if you are into retro gaming, I'd recommend going back to it. I know that you are, some of you are very young and uh, I recommend it. So, let's skip this one also. I'm trying to time manage, guys. So, um, this is the one that is from the mission you be stolen. You be stolen. Yes, when uh, Ubisoft got uh, its scripts and stuff uh, stolen, uh, they decided to go for just making of making fun of it. And in the second game for Watch Dogs, they have this mission where you get to stole some game documents, and they are referring to real li life events. So this is a fine example of awareness of the real world. Also, from The Witcher, we have this quote. What is this quote? <laughs> so I'm aim for the knee always. So um, I was an adventurer like you, but I took an arrow in the knee, remember? Skyrim. Skyrim, right? So this was a reference to the real world where Skyrim exists. Also, I think they're also referring to their future games. I will ask them in a moment. How do you ever start traveling with Avalach? As soon as I'd left you and Yen on the Isle of Avalon, I found myself pursued. Eredin and his Red Riders were on my heels. I fled through many worlds, many times. They came very close to catching me once. It was then that Avalach appeared. Out of nowhere, he found a portal and took us to a world where Eredin couldn't find us for, oh, perhaps half a year. The world where Eredin couldn't find you, what was it like? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Try me. People there had metal in their heads, waged war from a distance, using things similar to megascopes. And there were no horses. Everyone had their own flying ship instead. Siri, stop fooling around. Yeah, I will ask them. Maybe. I'm not sure, but this feels like a reference to Cyberpunk, and in Cyberpunk we see this. So this is another fine example of being aware at the same time themselves, and at the same time the awareness of the game as an artifact. Let's continue with the player experience. And if we go for, as designers, for creating this kind of effect, we can use uh, from gamer's brain, from Hodent, this system. The thing that we need is to engineer motivation, emotion, and the game flow will uh, appear as a result of implementing those. And the player inputs in the cybernetic circuit are results of a combination of emotion and motivation, says Hodent. And um, the feelings that we evoke are important. So with breaking the fourth wall or magic circle manipulation, we can aim for feelings in order to make the player do different things. So, um, 
it is impossible to quantify emotions. You can say that there are hundreds of them, but these are self-reported. So when you need to evoke something in the player, then you can choose something that was reported before. These are very common emotions. And in order to uh, engineer the uh, requirements for these emotions, we can use uh, a system like we can specify the targeted emotional outcome and targeted player behavior, and we can give some temporal and spatial qualifiers in order to do that. And if I go for a case study, it would be this moment in Doki Doki Literature Club where the first time we see Monica is breaking the fourth wall or manipulating the magic circle. So she says directly to the player at this moment, don't forget to save your game when there is an important choice. And when the player sees this, it's like, okay, she directly says that. But there is this emotion that comes out and that is what we are aiming for. Here, the targeted emotional outcome would be confusion and anxiety because the player understands that this is not a piece of cake. There is something going on with this game. Also, the player behavior that we would target would be saving the game. And the first time a character addresses the player and at the club before an important decision. These would be the qualifiers that we would use. I will show you just one example for anyway, this one. Here's Monica's writing tip of the day. Sometimes you'll find yourself facing a difficult decision. When that happens, don't forget to save your game. See? You never know when you might change your mind, when some, something unexpected might happen. <laughs> okay, break of the fourth wall. So yeah, at this moment, with all the players, we see the same emotional outcome. The anxiety and there's something going on, there's something weird. And at that moment, we transmit this match as this is no ordinary game. Anyway, here's my right. Another example would be, I do this a lot because I don't use a Mac normally. So with this one, we see um, targeted emotional outcome to be sadness and anxiety. And we want the player feel regret at the same time because he will lose whatever ring he have. So the player behavior would be to pause the game. We would want the player to pause the game the next time and do not leave Sonic idle for too long because this happens. And after three minutes in idle state and anywhere in game, Sonic does this and gets out of there. This is another case that this would be useful. So, yeah, I did it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, um, I am here for five minutes or something. I didn't time manage that well, but if you have any questions, just shoot. And if you don't like to do it here, we can uh, talk outside however you wish.